Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton, and I am the uh, mysterious botanical alien uh, inflicting some interesting uh, experiments on my co-host here, uh, um, this experimental organism. <laughs> Mike Glinka. Hello, everyone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're covering um, the Xenogenesis trilogy, it's book one, Dawn, uh, by Octavia Butler, and we're looking at uh, part two, Family, chapters three and four in today's episode. So um, shall we uh, talk about your predictions for this chapter from, from last time, Michael? Yeah, sure. Um, so last chapter it was uh, ended with... Um... Lilith being taken by Na- uh, Nikanj to his f- uh, f- his friends, so I thought that there'll be some drama arising um, when they actually get they you know if, uh, as kids uh, tend to do something uh, yeah. inappropriate. My second prediction was we learn a bit more co- about the culture of Von Kali and maybe more about Taya. And I thought that in my third prediction in chapter four, because today we're pre- um, covering. Um, Two chapters, chapter three and four. I thought that she'll begin her training, um, chapter hmm. four. But I th- yeah, but I think it's a bit too early for that. Yeah, well, that's not happened quite yet. Yeah, um, and the, I suppose the the drama with the young girl and Carly is a bit undermined by the fact that most of them don't seem to speak English, which makes it harder for them to slip up and disclose something. Yeah, in a way, in a way, I think I was sort of there, but in the same yeah. time, I think it's I overestimated what what may happen. So, hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's really hard. This this these chapters to predict anything, it's quite hard. The the author is really going to places where I'm not expecting. I would say. Hmm. And your uh, second one about the learning more about the culture of the Oankali. What do you think about uh, how much have we learned there? You know, it's there is something there, but in my mind, learning about the culture, I thought maybe you've like the, the sort of relationships of the Onkali or more of like the the sort of social standings, you know, something like you know, because obviously we know about the three different um sort of tribes within the Onkali, mm. but like I wanted to see what the um, what's more in that there is some mentioning of that in chapter four like the difference between the cal family and the th family but yeah. late but it's not really as in it's more about the i don't know the biologic biology of the ship i i think instead of but yeah i we'll get to the end point but like I, yeah i, I don't yeah. see much i didn't see much okay. in that perspective not a huge amount there okay then good should we do the sort of initial uh, summary of chapter three. Yeah, yeah, sure. So this chapter um, was pretty short. Like it, it was only like mm. two pages. So it was very, very um, quick to read. And basically, we meet uh, Nikan's friends who, um, after meeting Lilith, prodded her as a quote um, exposed flesh and tried to persuade her um, to take off her clothing. Um, you know, as which obviously angered Lilith, making her feel like she's a pet. Yeah. And, you know, mm. I fully understand Lilith, you know. But then again, yeah. if... But then we do the same thing, I guess, in humans to animals. Yes, definitely. Uh, the, I think the, the sort of pet dynamic is in this scenario is, is exacerbated by the language barrier, right? There's that you can't communicate very well yes, with them. Yes, yes. Which never helps in that situation. Yeah, and you know, obviously, in her anger, then she tells Nikanj to uh, that she wants to leave. Um, mm. So they go back home, and um, and I think what Lilith uh, needed at that point was solitude. But obviously, Nikanj was told not to leave her side. And mm. as in the book describes, she then tries to hide in the bathroom, um, trying to you know do some stuff to prolong the time of, of her solitude by cleaning her clothes. But as it said, no foreign matter stuck to it, no dirt, no sweat, not grease or water, uh, which I actually found quite interesting. Like um, it's some nice materials engineering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, because um, usually you know you either get something that is hydrophobic, so water does not um, touch to it, or lipophobic, mm. which oils don't attach but we have both here uh which yeah. is you know quite um interesting material and i did find some um example 
on internet of such material called a fluorophore. Uh-huh. Um, oh, and yeah. one of the examples were given as Teflon, Teflon is type mm. of the material. But in that particular floor of pore, sorry, floor pore, um, is mm. that they used a micro nano uh, rough surface with the Teflon material, which made it yeah, both yeah. hydrophobic and f- uh, lipophobic. It's interesting. Like I, I wonder how how the material that um, Lil you know, the cloth is made. In. But then at the same time, I think she said it's like super smooth, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Although, like the those kind of nano rough surfaces, they use them for doing things like um, putting waterproof coatings on electronic components. Mm-hmm. So you can just like take a PCB, stick it in this um, like oven, and deposit the kind of surface material on it, and then just like pour water on it, and it'll just bead off. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, I think it's that kind of. I thing. guess so. Well, um, I guess it's not really se- uh, detectable by a human sort of touch or something. Yeah, so it would be below the level at which you'd notice the feature size in all likelihood. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other thing that occurs to me is maybe it's biological in a, or uh, alive. Maybe there's microorganisms just in the cloth eating stuff that sticks to it. I did not think about it. That's a really interesting hypothesis. Um I guess, you know, considering the fact that everything is, almost everything on the ship is made of an or is a or- living organism, um, then I wouldn't be surprised that would be the case. Yeah, that the whole basis for their technology seems to be that, like, taking organisms and, and engineering them to perform particular purposes. So it, it, it seemed like a possibility, but I don't know how effective it would actually be, but... Uh... I wonder. I wonder because it's it sounds like a bit more like a silkworm, you know, producing silk or um, um, mm. but then you know we're here talking about the sort of the size of a bacteria or a fungus that you know not really visible for our eyes and yet living on our skin. I wonder. But then again, if an organism that lives on the material, if there's a chance of ingestion of the of the bacteria, would it cause any problem in the, in the organism? Uh, yeah, I suppose it depends what. Yeah. I mean, if you're, th- you're talking about an engineered organism, I suppose it depends what kind of parameters you've got, right? Whether what kind of stuff it's expecting it might have to eat, and what kind of stuff you're actually producing and putting in its environment. So, I mean, in the case of Lilith, it would depend whether or not they'd successfully adapted it to handle human stuff, I suppose. But it seems like they take that step. Um, I think that the, the human stuff, it's in chapter four, there will be more about it because it's. It, uh, yeah, we come back to that. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Uh, yeah. Oh, so there's a, in this uh, section of the chapter, there's a, a little section where um, uh, Nikan just telling her a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And it just, you just randomly gets dropped in that um, uh, the. Like six divisions ago, I think it was the the Owen Carly had like done their gene exchange thing with a species of like intelligent schooling fish on a water planet, and there's oh, yes, no yes, more yes, said yes. about it. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was a good little drop in for, for background context. So. Well, I think uh, because in the in the chapter it says that he trying to calm her down her her anger about the whole idea of um. Being you know, being prodded by the Onkali, mm. um, he, he I think their exchange of like you know knowledge um, was what sort of kept Lilith sort of sane and calm in a way. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, and I think that she alluded to the whole process of teaching mm-hmm. Nikan just being kind of uh, retreat, as it were, you know, it's something that she could lose herself in a little bit. I think it's also uh, I don't know if this this chapter or the next chapter, but uh, but it comparing it to Charade, like no, but I think it's the next chapter, isn't it? Hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. The in, it's interesting that the the fact that you know the um, six divisions ago that I wonder in perspective of how many hundreds of years of millennia was that? Good question. I don't know how long that would be. Um... Did they never speak about this in the book, in general? I don't remember if they ever mentioned a specific like time frame for how long it takes between divisions, but I, I, presumably each one is on the order of several hundreds to thousands of years because I imagine it has to be between star systems. Mm-hmm. 
right? We'll have to move between distant, some find some new intelligent species somewhere in the universe. Depends how frequently they crop up, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder. I mean, I was interested when I read like six divisions ago. So, what other th- creatures? But then, does it make the Onkali great swimmers? Can they breathe underwater? I think they can. Did they mention that? Too? Yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah. We mentioned that they're they're am- amphibious to some degree, or well, at least as comfortable in water as out of it, which is an oh yeah, feature. yeah. Last it was last yeah. last uh, last episode. Hmm. Yeah, but let's go back to the uh, to the rest of the chapter because it's really short. Hmm. Um. In the book, she then tried to go to sleep with her mind racing with questions, thoughts about the modification the Onkali performed and whether they actually care about their experiments. And we're talking about, you know, the modifications to humans in here. Hmm. She eventually falls asleep, tired of, you know, thinking. And then once she wakes up, she finds Nikanj that he joined her. And her first impulse was to push the child away or in revulsion or get up. But on her second thought, she just went back to sleep again. Hmm. And I don't know, it feels to me, uh, in a way, Lilith here is, uh, and this is where the chapter three ends, and it feels to me that Lilith, um, I don't know, that thought was sort of trying to um, express, I don't know, find a exhaust of, of her frustration on a child, which is hmm. not, doesn't make her a great person herself i mean i feel like you know the child him you know itself is not really um in any fault i would say yeah i think it's it's still kind of that residual visceral aversion that she was initially struggling with 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 Steyer. ah you mean like the the way they look yeah and and you know just the kind of sheer alienness of of their being right you know you've got these weird ah, tentacle things and it's kind of and there's getting up in your personal space while you're trying to sleep um i I can imagine that would be you know you'd have a a snap reaction to that right you you, that would probably be an involuntary kind of a impulse i guess so but then i think i didn't read into that like that i thought it was more like uh in her anger still sort of she you know i don't know the, the other angle on it is that he's you know, he's a child, but he's he's at least as old as her, so he's kind of only a child in the Owen Carly's eyes, not necessarily from her perspective. And also he's kind of participating in the whole experiment on her, right? Uh, so you know, she, Yeah, it's true. Maybe he's not as innocent as I was thinking. Maybe the use of child in the book is sort of, I don't know, I imagine literally a child, and but then I need to uh, be more careful about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a they have a weird, tricky, ambiguous state. You know, it's a different biology of their maturation. So, how, how to say what is an analog of a child is tricky. Mm, mm, I guess so. Um, should I go to the predictions for the chapter four? So, because it's gonna uh, yeah, be a long yeah. chapter. So, so here I wrote for myself that I think that in chapter four there won't be any more training in terms of like the my previous prediction that she will do some training, starting to do some training. I think considering that the whole section is called family, so I think this is hmm. gonna take a while before she's even taught like I don't know, starting to fulfill her role in any way. But I did write here that she will finally meet Daya again and she uh, then aggressively will try to get some information from him about what is the plan or whether there is a possibility to her for her to move around the ship freely by herself. So in okay. that prediction, I think obviously she doesn't meet Daya, but that yeah. possibility for her to move around the ship freely, I meant isn't like you know being able to open the doors and stuff like. But I think here it's mm. sort of this correct in a way, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean it, it, it's she kind of more has an encounter with with caveat than Daya. But um, yeah, and you know, that whole kind of running away from from um, uh, her, like the locality of, the, of that family to uh, the other area, and mm. she has a bit a, a bit of freedom of motion, but still not able to you know open the doors and stuff. Yeah, but we do learn a bit more about it. Um, it's I think it's also Kaguya, what an asshole! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, he's definitely kind of condescending, isn't he? Oh my god! If yeah. I ever met an asshole in my life, that wasn't me. It, that's definitely him. <laughs> Um, shall shall yeah. we go into the chapter 4 introduction yeah let's go 
so we saw the chapter with Lilith wishing to things to meet and speak mm-hmm. another human being and to catch an yep. on Kali lying to her. Uh, and I think it comes down to the fact that she cannot find a fault in on Kali and that makes her she well not fault but more vulnerability in her in them so that they um yeah uh, so she can feel that there's some something that you know it's not perfect about them but unfortunately mm. for her none of this happened on Kali will speak half truth missing some details but never lie we are told that she does enjoy Nikan's presence in a way um mm. They exchange their knowledge, um, but it, she still thinks about herself as an experimental animal that's kept uh, to be kept and bred in captivity to bring back the populations like we humans do for certain an- for animals that are on the brink of extinction. And we learn more about Nikanj, that same as Sharad. He has an eidetic Id- memory. Being basically yeah. memori- uh, be able to memorize everything what he saw and heard, uh, which made her feel like um, this is l- worse than them in a way because she doesn't have the ability, yeah. and that's what prompts her to ask Nikanj if Onkali ever write things down. Hmm. Just to circle back briefly to that point about the the Onkali's. Um, honesty or, or dishonesty as it were mm-hmm. um and that they're, they're upfront about the fact that they're just not going to tell her stuff that they don't want her to know yeah so they're kind of being honest about the way in which they're being dishonest and it's even more irritating than if they just didn't tell her no <laughs> that's that's correct <great. laughs> yeah yeah it's just like infuriating the way that they handle the dissemination of information is driving the left nuts and i can totally understand why uh I would be. I think it goes there to show what happens next, because you know the mm. whole situation is quite, um, mm. I would say, strange in my opinion. Um, okay. Which basically, well, this is what chapter says. You know, this um, when Lilith asked to, you know, if Onkali ever write things down um, or. Mm. Um, or, you know, if she could write things down on a piece of material or paper to, to, to memorize things. Um, hmm. this is, it leads to a quite surprising finding where she was told by Nikanj that she's forbidden to write things down. That she yeah. won't be given any material or write with. And when prompted to why, he would not tell her. It's going back to the, yeah. you know, not telling her, like, And even that the, the Owen Carly have a bunch of human records and, like, you know, drives and papers and stuff that they won't give her or probably any of the other humans access to like they have you know the archives of the human civilization but they're forbidden to the remaining humans which is particularly galling i think also um it's forbidden to some of the onkali isn't it because in the chapter it said that not everybody has only certain amount of onkali have access to that those records um i think it was more that um Nick, in the discussion with Nakanj, like Nakanj knows that they exist but can't really read them because he doesn't speak English very I well. See, I see. So I think it was more about the fact that not all of the Owen Carly have read them because they don't speak English. Okay, I'm not quite I sure see. exactly what the. I don't know if it was necessarily a you know they're not allowed to look at them. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of uh, I just want to circle back to the whole eidetic memory thing and how that relates to this. Uh huh. Um, and I think there's a. Um, I've been kind of speculating about their whole genetic abilities and the way this eidetic memory thing works. And you know, the way memory works in, in humans in the kind of nervous system type paradigm is that, you know, you've got the, it's kind of it's saved in, in like a network, right? It's in the relationships between neurons, as it were. It's not very binary. It's not or, or, um, or symbolic, right? It, it, it's not something that's, that's serialized the way writing is, right? So we have this kind of external storage medium of, of writing in computers where we can store our collective knowledge in a, in a serialized format, right? With a standardized mm-hmm. symbolic alphabet. And it seems like the Owen Carly could do that internally, right? If they had a, an, organ, an, uh, an organelle, where, as it were, a capacity to read genetic material, you could save memory in a serialized format. That is a good point. You can just point. write bits of DNA. 
Yeah, because it goes back to the fact of the divisions and, you know, Chitaya and everybody else, the older on Kali remember every the division and stuff like that. It must be something related to what their ability to uh, write, you know, read and write memory, from, I don't know, in some organic matter like DNA, you know, as we discussed in the previous chapter. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems to me that that might well be something to do with the, the mechanism there, right? They've got this genetic memory and they seem to be able to do this um you know remembering stuff with complete clarity so some hybrid between those two methods where you can you know serialize data if for long term storage but also have the sort of the neural net associational recall type stuff that you can do with a, a brain because they seem to have a nervous system as well but i thought it's a really cool um uh, sort of way of thinking about that analogy mm -hmm. in that you know, Lilith is stuck with this kind of external necessity to to serialize stuff into to words, and the Ankali kind of that's kind of weird and alien to them because I think they have the ability to do something like that in their head. Yeah, but I wonder if you know if something happened to you know, let's say some Ankali that you know, let's. I mean, potentially it means that I mean it obviously shows that all the Ankali have different sort of knowledge because obviously some of them later on we learn that they can speak Japanese um, and the other languages and so maybe not all of them contain the same knowledge but so there must be some way yeah. to store the information externally so they can access it because otherwise if something happened to a let's say on Kali that possess all the knowledge that previous um, on Kali had now let's say that shared like a mother brain let's say so my suspicion on that point is that they all have all the memories or m most of them right mm -hmm. anything that they want to put in that kind of communal format but they don't all have the kind of the neural net representation of their relationships to one another because it would be computationally intractable to have all those relationships between the facts kind of known to you uh, you just couldn't figure that out from just the serialized data or you mm -hmm. won't be able to reconstruct that network so you're you can like how it would work with respect to like associational recall to something that you've got in a, a serialized library i'm not sure you'd have to have some kind of procedure for like scanning through it mm -hmm. or, or some way of having someone else communicate to you where to look who yes, already had yes. the kind of relational representation in their head indexing down to uh for exactly yeah you need an index yeah yeah so I think they probably all have that information. They just don't all have the index to find it. I wonder if there's an Onkali that has the index and basically, you know, like all that. But I guess I still think that there has to be some sort of method of storing the information outside just in case any other Onkali want to access it. Because, I mean, hmm. you know, in the same time, if you store all that information yourself, let's say the Onkali all store the same data. I mean... Yeah. It's quite a lot of data redundancy, isn't it? Like, it's waste of sort of... Do you have to store all that information? I suppose not. Um, but, uh, I mean, I suppose there's the ship. I suppose that might well um, have a, a large repository of it. And then, of course, we talked before about the, the data density of DNA, right? You know, it's it's not matter. It's not a matter of, like, you know, how much they can memorize. It's I, I feel like hmm. it's just... The fact that, you know, you have a knowledge, but you hmm. don't use it at all. There's a problem in there, I think. Yeah, yeah, I can see what you mean. I suppose the solution might be something like um, just randomly distributing samples from the, like, the pool of knowledge to different individuals, right? So you can, I don't know, there might be, you know, there's some core stuff that they want everyone to have, but then they just give everyone a random sampling of other stuff so they can keep some copies of it and if they need to access information they can kind of you know communicate with one another look up a copy of it just sort of a distributed like and sharded database type system where they can spread out all of the uh, uh, information across the individuals um, just have it in their their memory i guess uh, considering that on the last chapter um we find that uloi is sort of the the uloi are a bit higher in hierarchy in a way maybe they are the sort of storage uh hmm. beings but then again who knows maybe we'll find later 
Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's continue with the chapter. Let's move on to the next bit. Um, yeah. So as um, Nikanj told Lilith that um, he, she cannot write or anything down. And I think this relates down to the fact that Watch Diet also told her that you know they want them to start from fresh um, mm. on Earth. Um, it really angers Lilith. And so when Nikanj went, goes to get her some food, she just wanders off away from the house, like completely, until obviously Nikanj realizes, goes, comes back with her and realizes she's not there. And he start, catches up to her, telling her she's not allowed to move away from him. Which then leads to quite a, uh, I would say, comical and also um, uh, behavior from Lilith trying to escape from him each time he sort of goes away from her for a second and that causes Nikan to sort of eventually give up on chasing her or just basically giving her some time realizing that she sort of wants to do that on her own. Yeah. Uh, but he does tell her just in case she ever gets lost uh, she's supposed to tell her name in Onkali. So, Dokal, Tedin, Taya, Lilith, Eka, Kaguyad, Adinso. And we know that we are told that Do means an adopted non Onkali, Kal meaning kinship mm-hmm. group name, and Eka means a child. And a child had had no sex uh, in the Onkali species, uh, hmm. as very young uh, Onkali did not. Um, which is interesting because they have this sort of um, their names relate to what they are. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about that in terms of. Um... Because it, you know these names give them this relationship to one another. It made me think that they must either have sort of semi-permanent or very strongly enduring relationships in order to have a naming schema that you know is stable over time, or they change their names a lot uh, depending on how their relationships shift. Because considering like the Eka, I'm sure she w- she would drop the Eka mm. eventually. Well, on Ankali would yeah. drop Eka eventually. Mm. Um, it feels to me that yeah, it's it the, the I would say the blood ties, if you can so in inverted commas, uh, mm. must be really strong between Onkali. But then again, they do mm. sort of I don't know. It's the the, the ability to, ability to have their gene modified by the Uloi. It's so intimate, it's such an in, intimate thing that probably there's nothing more intimate than that. Um, mm. Then so I guess their ties between each. Sp- uh, member of their sort of family, it must be really strong. I wonder if the if Chitaya, um, I wonder if there's going to be a situation where Kaguya tells something to uh, Lilith that really, you know, he shouldn't have, like, you know, because considering his attitude towards her, and Chitaya sort of mm. maybe lashes out at, uh, at it, and um, I wonder if there's going to be some sort of drama. Um, there, I wonder if there's anything like that's gonna happen. Like this hmm. is something um... interesting. Yeah, because so far the Owen Carly seem very unified in their f- sort of the front that they're presenting to Lilith. They're pretty coordinated in their action. It'd be interesting to see if there's some some discord arises between them, and how that's handled. How they do conflict resolution. Yeah, because we haven't seen any conflict so far at the Owen Carly. We are not really told anything about them. Um, I wonder if. Um... I wonder if it's gonna happen in the future or not. Don't say anything. <laughs> yeah, I'll. Uh, uh, yeah, remain quiet. Um, on the the point of the um, apparently non genetic sex determination that they have, that's that's a, a, a new bit about their biology that we didn't really know before. Oh yes, yes. So I, apparently, I, it's something. I didn't think of that. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, because it says a child yeah. has no sex. Okay, so they decide what the child is gonna be, whether it's gonna be a male, female, or an oloi. Oh, I suppose we don't know. We just know that they, the child doesn't have a known sex, so presumably it's non-genetic. I mean, that, that's a, a thing in b- organisms on Earth, right? There's um, temperature-related sex oh, yes, determination yes, in yes. things like crocodiles, crocodiles yeah. and then there's um, changes in sex over life course. There's a lot of fish that will switch sex uh, depending on environmental conditions. Isn't there the... Uh, do not... Do octopi... Uh, like all have penises, but then depending on which one gets stabbed with their penis, I think they rip off their penises and then they just try to stab each other and whoever gets stabbed with it becomes the female? I do not know that one. That's, uh, it, it sounds plausible. Yeah, there's a yeah, lot of weird stuff in weird biology. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a whole, um, whole weirdly eclectic collection of ways of, of doing sex determination. 
watched a good lecture from someone at the Royal Institution um, mm-hmm. talking about that. So put it in the show notes. I remember um, there was this bird that um, it had sort of it's it's like there's a female and two males, right? And uh, mm-hmm. the males separate into sort of you can say an alpha male and a beta male, right? Which is interesting okay. because right, so the alpha male obviously um, fights for the female and then sort of protects the environment, but the beta male, right? Mm-hmm. It it doesn't interact or like fight for the uh, environment that it's in, but it sneakily mm-hmm. goes into female and copulates with it. Yeah, and. Yeah, yeah. But in the same time, there's a symbiotic relationship between the alpha and the beta male because the alpha male has to protect the environment. But when the female, I think, if I remember correctly, I need to check it again. Um, if yeah. the female, when the female lays the eggs, I think the beta male also protects them. So when the alpha male is huh. on feeding and looking for food and traveling around, the beta male also sort of protects the children in a way. But it never knows whether it's the children, the offsprings of an alpha or the beta male. So. There's a quite a few systems like that. I, there's one in I forget the fish species. There's so many of them, but um, there's one with with at least three different male morphs. Where there's one that like protects the next and, and has a really like shiny um, visual display, mm-hmm. and then there's two different other forms of like uh, subordinate males. There's one that like um, just kind of sneaks in and, and bombs sperm over the the eggs when the female lays them, and there's another one that does some kind of like patrolling thing around the periphery. There's a whole bunch of these different like uh, sort of games around uh, how the male can be involved, and there's weird stuff like um, another fish species where um, the the there's the only females in this species, and they're kind of parasitic on another very closely related species that has males, but the females are um, they're obligated to copulate, but they don't use the sperm of the male to. Uh, fertilize their eggs they reproduce parthenogenically but they need the sperm from this other species males in order to break the zona pellucida and start the developmental process so it's a super weird it's like ecology. evolution was drunk at some point and decided oh, let's <laughs> give this one like okay this one's gonna need sex but it actually doesn't yeah that sounds good yeah that's the same strategy that won't mean the population just like grows and grows and then crashes and grows and grows and crashes. That's it. Because they, they they grow and grow in the population, and then like all of the males from this other fe- species that they're parasitizing are just fertilizing all these females that are not using any of their genetic material until the point where they just get so many females that there's no new fish and the whole population crashes and they've got to start again. What in there? It's very bizarre. Oh, that's that's yeah. crazy. Uh, mm. It's going to be even more crazy for me to looking for the references of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that, that Royal Institution talk covered a whole bunch of these, so that's one place to go for okay, that. Okay, awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll send you that one. <laughs> um, so let's go back to the chapter. Um, yeah. So during one of her wanderings, Lilith's wanderings around the, the area she of the house, well, the area of her group, um, she overhears accidentally to Uncle talking about humans and you use use the word kaizidi i don't know what language that is actually in fact i don't know i assume it's just an invented one i would guess uh oh maybe it's the onkali Onkali. language i thought it was sort of like a human language but maybe my assumption was wrong Hmm. and that makes her stop uh to listen um because she thought it was about herself but um but Hmm. when she approached they stopped talking started communicating with tentacles and this sort hmm. of happens a few times um, when she when she overhears more on other on Kali talking about another human, a man named F- uh, Fukumoto. Um, and eventually, through sort of eavesdropping on some of the on Kali, she finds out about a man named Fukumoto that he's somewhere. He lives somewhere in the TH uh, kinship group, which are also the Dinso people. Yeah, this is just the, they seem to have these geographic separations within the ship by kin, kinship group. Mm. Um, so there's a whole area where this Chej group is located, then separate from the, the Kal group. So according to the book, she be, uh, she belongs to the Kal uh, kinship group. Um, so and while Fukumoto belonged to the Teach kinship uh, group. So obviously she decides to uh, go to Tej and try to find him to finally speak to a mm. human, but 
as she described the journey was up for nothing she said to her she thinks to, to herself that it'd be more uh, for her uh, interesting and satisfying to stay home and daydream about meeting another human than actually to look for one yeah it's uh, not very straightforward to locate a, another human in this uh, world where they're kind of forbidden to one another and considering she can't get anywhere because everything is closed from her you know, it's um, it's obvious that she won't be able to travel much except for if she sneaks through the door while Don Carly opened mm. them for her. I just wanted to point out that there's a little quote here. That the, the Owen Carly had removed her so completely from her own people only to tell her they planned to use her as a Judas goat. And they had done it all so softly without brutality and with patience and gentleness so corrosive of any resolve on her part. Uh, so she's sort of reflecting as she's wandering around on how well the Owen Carly have sort of subdued her kind of will to resist. Mm. Um, she's sort of you know helplessly having to participate in their their plan. And and again uh, earlier at the very beginning of this chapter, she kind of mentioned how irrationally important it was to her to find another human. Yes, yes. And I just wanted to say that this that reflects that uh, quite high degree of self awareness that Lilith shows. You know, she's she's very much noticing what the uh, Owen Carly are doing to her and, and how effective it is. But she's kind of helpless to resist it, despite the fact that she recognizes it, uh, which is um, similar to that whole problem she had earlier of, like, they won't lie. They won't directly kind of... They won't do me the courtesy of mm -hmm. lying to me. Mm -hmm. They'll just straight up tell me and they're not going to tell me anything. Um, and it's this kind of super frustrating way that they have that she's uh, you know, fully aware of, but feeling totally helpless to resist it even though she's like fully aware of what they're doing um which is uh, a, an interesting headspace for her to be in i think also it feels to concerning her solitude being somewhere completely isolated from everyone and you're surrounded by this unknown environment where you have no freedom mm. having the ability to speak to someone and not just you know speaking to someone but also of your own sort of group is mm. what really human what humanity is isn't it because we make our yeah. own groups we and even you know as much for example as antisocial as i can be and stay home and play games <laughs> eventually too. you know it's gets to the point where i need a human you know i can i need to see another human being because we are social yep. species and um it we need that um contact and i feel that mm -hmm. If she's not gonna go insane at some point, then it'll be a miracle. Yeah, uh, so they're, they're kind of um, forcing themselves as a surrogate for those human interactions, which is why she's so sort of helpless to their approach because she needs human interaction. So she's substituting interaction with them for human interaction, mm. which I think is deliberately what they're doing. And it's kind of analogous to what like um, uh, cult initiation type stuff. Where you know they isolate you from all of the the like the normies and only expose you to other cult members and they like you know, the whole sort of break them down and build them back up again kind of attitude it uh, mirrors that approach here I think that's messed up I think like I to be honest when I mm. I try to imagine myself in when I read these chapters I try to imagine myself in Lilith's shoes right I try to imagine myself mm -hmm. waking up and then finding about the species considering that you and I are scientists, right? And being a scientist, I have this intrinsic interest, curiosity of trying, you know, figure out things, how mm. they work, etc. Et if I was told that I cannot write things down, that I cannot sort of know about their science, I think I would, I don't know, mm. they would really have to stop yeah. me from doing really weird stuff to myself to sort of trying to deal with this lack of ability to yeah. do anything or yeah. meet with them or learn anything that I intrinsically want to do it. The lack of control over any of this is so frustrating. Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, from the perspective of you know, the, the scientific curiosity and so on, it's like, ah, there's aliens, they're intelligent, they have all this really cool and interesting biology and they can make people live longer and they've got stasis and they've space flight. And it's like, there's all this cool stuff that they've got, but it's like, we're not going to tell you about it. And you're not allowed to look at your own civilization's records and you can't write anything down. It feels, uh, yeah, yeah, I just like sitting here in silence <laughs> feeling like there's this like, it's like a tease, like, like itch that you yeah. cannot scratch. Ugh. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's uh, perfectly calibrated to drive you nuts. Oh my god, it's yeah. Ugh, goosebumps. <laughs> let's mm. let's maybe continue because this is, I think, getting interesting in here. That's that the chapter mm -hmm. was really getting interesting. So we find okay. that Liv, uh, well, find that she cannot find the human, so she decides to go home. And on the way, as in early on mentioned, we didn't mention, but she, uh, Nikanj told her that if she eats something and she wants to get rid of, she can just bury in the ground and the ship will get rid of it. So what she does mm -hmm. is here by being on the th uh, kinship group area she had some orange peels and she digs uh, you know she puts them in the ground and then you know because mm -hmm. she knows knowing that they would be gone within a day broken die by the tendrils of the ship or own living matter but what we mm -hmm. find is that actually um the ground where the peelings were put on starts to darken and start to become mud like and the, basically what happens is the peelings reacted with the ground and so it'll be going to smell decomposing it starts mm. to throw down Kali and as they throw questions at her she obviously doesn't understand so when they ask them if they can speak English they respond to her in Japanese obviously yeah. because she was uh, in the area where Fukumoto-san uh, Fukumoto was but they didn't speak mm. other language which goes back to what idea they don't actually share that much of knowledge and being not being yes, able to no. communicate uh, she was only able to observe with other on Kali that the damage she caused that the orange mm. the orange peel started to cause them this more orange mass to grow and getting bigger bigger up to three feet across and being circular like a sort of tumor and yeah. uh, when one of the fleshy tentacles from the ship of the pseudo plants touched it, it lashed out as if in agony. And Elizabeth then realized that what she did was it caused harm to the ship. Uh, but eventually an Uloi steps in and touches the orange mud, stopping the reaction. Uh, to her surprise, she recognized the Uloi and the Uloi being the asshole Kaguya. And <laughs> who the first thing yep. to tell uh, says to her is, how have you managed to remain so promising and yet so ignorant? I'm an asshole. My goodness. Yeah, no, it's a, it, yeah very condescending tone that that Kaguya has. Um, Man, but, yeah, the, the the ship's reaction there is is interesting. Yeah. Right? it's almost like an allergic reaction. Right? It's it's this weird foreign thing that it's, and then it has the whole. It starts smelling. Yes, and the Uloi or I mean not the Uloi, the Owen Carly all come over. It seems like um, you know, like like an, an immune cell response, like you know, leaking some some stuff out yes. into the cellular environment, um, so that all the immune cells come and like deal with the situation. It's, I think it seems analogous. Right? It's the smell is like a signal that something needs to be fixed. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, let's go back to it. Let's just finish the chapter and then we'll come back to this. So. The sure. first thing, uh, obviously, what he saw is like, what the hell? And then when she asked him what he uh, was doing here, he only says to her, so you finally found something to poison. And, uh, and again, a condescending tone. And of course, which Lilith, mm. to which Lilith explains him the whole situation. Um, and, and to that, Kaguya tells her that she should only bury things in the Cal kinship area. And if she wanted mm. to leave things outside that area, just give it to another Uloi. And the chapter ends with the conversation conversation about Fukumoto-san. Kaguya is aware that Lilith uh, was eavesdropping, and he tells her that mm. he that Fukumoto-san died in the age of 120 years old, being awake for 60 years. And when yeah. um, Lilith tells him that the idea keeping idea uh, keeping humans here as separated is cruel. Um, Kaguya just dismisses her and takes her back home to give uh, her and Nikanj an earful. And that's where the chapter ends. Hmm. Yep. And I think this is quite interesting, the whole orange peel thing, because it indicates yeah. that even though it goes back to the conversation we had before about the um, human food and, you know, the it would, it would be toxic to the Onkali or not. Considering that hmm. oh, maybe it's not toxic to the Onkali, but it might be toxic to the ship itself because it it does show that the area around the where Lilith is right when she throws something on the ground, um, it's been fine mm. in that area of the ship, but the other area is not, and it maybe is as toxic as you know if if we went some other foreign planet and decided to eat a plant out of there just to try and suddenly we die because it's poisonous. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's um 
so um, when they said that they learned to eat human food um, and that whole thing about how I think that was like genetic learning to eat the food and you know, acquiring the necessary you know, enzymes yes. or whatever. Um, and I'm assuming that that learning has not taken place sort of across the board. Yeah. And that they haven't just sort of distributed that knowledge universally. I think it's it proves the whole point, like that it's collected to an area right so if we went to from the from dinso to the other um groups the ones for example the 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 good the ones that are gonna travel away with the ship that they are unchanged and go travel further you know co- continue traveling if something like this Indeed. happened to all they ate the human food i think that would cause mm. them to be a poison that would be a poison to them yeah yeah i suppose that another sort of question arising from that is to what degree do the species that the Oankali do their trading with become integrated with the Oankali? Mm. And like, do they just become the Oankali? They become one thing? And how long do they keep kind of original members of the species around for? So it may well be that they need different localized environments that are suited to other species that they've um, you know, done this trade mm-hmm. with uh, for an extended period of time after... Uh, they they initially meet them because they've still got you know individuals with specific requirements, or they may even just like be a, a matter of taste, right? And I, I prefer the the water planet style way of living, so you know this section of the ship's an aquarium. Yeah, I think there must be something there, but it also feels like it's um in a way a zoo of some sort, like when you think about it. Because mm. it has separated areas, of course they are separated in the kinship areas. That's fine, um, but considering mm. that, for example, that Fukumoto-san was living in the other area, it's surprising that, for example, the the land around that area is not adapted to human food. Do you know what I mean? That's a good point, actually. Because yeah. mm. I mean, mm. it's not that Fukumoto-san would eat something different to to us, right? I'm mm. sure they would. It's more cost effective to to make the food and whatever everybody was eating so that, you know, everybody is the same thing instead of getting everybody individual mm. diet, right? And obviously, mm. you know, there are some things that grow in Japan that, you know, for example, we haven't, wouldn't have a chance to tr- taste if we, if, and if there wasn't the possibility to travel around. So, but nowadays it's quite easy to get stuff that from, you know, east uh, or from the east, you know, in the shop. So it's it's not that much of a problem. Yeah. So and it, they're not toxic to us. So considering that that fact, mm. I wonder what the actual reason behind that you know this happened. Like is an orange peel, like is an orange peel some acids in the orange peel, or maybe just the structure of the orange peel was um, toxic to the ship itself in general, or maybe is it something mm. just in particular that area she happened to encounter that you know caused the damage. Yeah, I wonder if perhaps I'm trying to think of a way in which this would be consistent because it does seem a little inconsistent to have you know like it's, it's not like uh, you know Fukumoto is not going to be you know drinking orange juice occasionally or something yeah that doesn't really add up right so it would make sense for them to have a common human environment but maybe he was subject to more kind of integration with the Oankali. Maybe they had him eating Oankali food or adapted him to a different state of affairs than they did with Lilith. Because I suppose they might be experimenting with different ways of um, bringing the humans into the relationship with the Oankali. And maybe they try a few different strategies for that kind of thing. Like, you know, adapt the mm. humans to Oankali mm. food, adopt the Oankali to humans' food. I, I don't know. I mean, it's plausible because, I mean... He was away awake for sixty years. I mean, sixty years. It potentially could mean, but then again, if they woke him up, you can't really modify a genome like that, can you? Like, I mean, I mean, they well, did not, modify. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to do. Modify Lilith, and you know, so potentially there is possibility of the, your hypothesis, considering you know that they modified him to be able to eat um, on Kali food. I I wonder. It's it's. Either it's an, in, an inconsistency or something like what you said, or he hit a spot of a ship that basically was quite vulnerable and she found something that might be toxic to um, Don Kali. Okay, uh, uh, interesting interpretation. But uh, 
crank up the paranoia and not. I, like <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, it's okay. really interesting, and I, I, I feel sorry for her in a way that you know it was really an accident, and hmm. then obviously, and she happened to just meet Kaguya, who is an asshole. And yeah, he's been following her around. Yeah, yeah. and it's it feels to me that um, it's a. Sh- I, I wonder what's going on with Daya. I wonder what's gonna mm. happen. Well, in my next chapter prediction, I feel like basically the chapter is gonna be um, Kaguya is gonna rip another one to uh, in Lilith and Nikanj uh, for what happened, mm. and I think there's gonna be big argument of like she didn't mean to do it, but then the whole idea of like what he said to her that how have you managed to remain so promising and yet so ignorant it's like it's mm. it's so yeah. condescending at the same time so like she literally just was woken up maybe she's been up like i don't know like several a week or so or a bit, a bit longer you know of being able to walk around them um, and she did yeah. tell Nikanj that she, you know, the memory. She needs to write something down that she was not allowed to. So how can she? How can you learn without the repetition of something, right? If you want to write down something down and you can repeat it and cover, repeat and etc. etc. You learn faster like this way, mm. you know, the repetition. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what it is that the Oankali regard as being so promising in the humans, and I'm pretty sure there's a kind of there's a mismatch in what's perceived there because I, I like. Uh, Lilith doesn't get what they see in her. I don't think. I don't think she understands why they think she's so promising. And I, I think it's probably not just like intelligence. Although they did say that the humans are one of the most intelligent species they've met. But it's something to do with this whole, you know, interest in their their cancer and stuff. But it's uh, yeah, it's hard to figure out what they're actually interested in. I just I'm not getting what in earth do they want from her like what what is why is kaguya i mean like when initially taya was talking about the uloi and she, they were like oh cancer is they're so cool i thought imagine myself the uloi being like nerds like us basically oh my god like kanye <laughs> and then you get condescending asshole like that it's just like really that's that for me that was such a crushing image of a character hmm. <laughs> yeah uh, well, I suppose it might. Yeah, again, thinking about it in the related to their perceptual abilities, maybe it's just like they they see this you know, intelligent entity with this really interesting genetics, and it's kind of wandering around, bumbling and unaware of all this interesting stuff that they can see. So, like it, watching someone who's who's blind like stumble around a room where you can see all this stuff. And then being condescending towards them. It's like... Yeah. I said, that's where the arse yeah, bit comes yeah, it's in. Like, right? Honestly? It's, it's not her fault. It's, it feels to me that basically they they really don't... I don't know. I think what would really solve this whole situation is that, you know, Kaguya and um, Chitaya and Lilith just sitting down, the whole family sitting down, and Lilith just saying, okay, this is the problem, this and this and this. <laughs> Can you please explain to me hmm. why I cannot do this, this, and this? How about I meet with other humans? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And just, just solve this problem. And that would be really not a problem. But I feel like otherwise this book would hmm. be really boring if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I might not necessarily permit the Owen Carly to achieve whatever their ends are. Right? Maybe they need... Man, it's it's so hard. Yeah, it's, it's so hard to predict anything this book is going towards because it's just... I mean, the only <laughs> prediction I put down, as I said earlier, is that Lilith and Nikanj are going to be being told off. But, like, I really cannot <laughs> think where this book is going to go. Like, suddenly we're talking about, you know meeting the kids and they you know they anger Lilith and she goes go home and then suddenly you talk about the she hears about another human and then it's just like oh my god where is this book even heading towards it's just it's a toughie yeah I think uh, a part of that actually um I think that reflects well on the writing in that it, the the sense of frustrated disorientation that that generates in the reader is the same thing that Lilith is feeling hundred percent agree i think it just proves how <laughs> to be honest when when i read books right i often don't think about the stuff but behave because i'm analyzing mm. this book so much now by reading it and you know mm. i've realized i really do have an appreciation to miss butler for writing this book is honestly is an incredible it's an incredible book and it's just 
Yeah, so she's a very insightful author, right? And very economical, right? She's very incisive. She can convey a lot of, of nuance and context and sort of background implications of machinations in just a, a few words. It's uh, it's very well done. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next chapters. I, I, I it's like itching. It, it's it's like a really an itch I cannot scratch. That I have to read a chapter by chapter thing. It's just like oh, oh. Yeah. So annoying. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, nothing I can do about that, I'm afraid. Yeah, on that note, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everyone, for yes. today. Today is a sh- bit short chapter. I, I wonder, what do you think? Next, uh, we're going to cover one chapter next time or two chapters again? Mm, I have not looked at the lengths of the next two chapters. Uh, let's, let's figure it out and put it in the episode description. Yep, um, absolutely. Right, everyone, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, I was Mike Nguyen. And I was Rich Dad.